Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to read something uh, to you this morning. This is by Chuck Swindoll. It says, if there's one attitude families are guilty of more than any other when it comes to mothers, it's presumption, taking them for granted, being nearly blind on occasion to the load moms carry. This was reinforced in my mind last week as I was thumbing through a row of crazy greeting cards at a local drugstore. Time and again, the joke in the car drew its humor from the obvious attitude that pervades a household. Forget the housework, Mom. It's your day. Besides, you can always do double duty and catch up on Monday. <laughs> but my favorite was a great big card that looked like a third grader had printed it. On it was a little boy with a dirty face and torn pants pulling a wagon load of toys. On the front it read, Mom, I remember the little prayer you used to say for me every day. And inside it read, God help you if you do that again. <laughs> Jimmy Dean, the country western singer, you guys might know him more as the sausage maker, uh, does a number that always leaves me with a big knot in my throat. It's entitled, I owe you. In the song, a man is looking through his wallet and comes across a number of long-standing IOUs to his mother, which he names one by one. Borrowing that idea, I suggest you, who have been guilty of presumption, unfold some of your own IOUs that are now yellow with age. Consider the priceless value of the one woman who made your life possible, your mother. Think about her example, her support, her humor, her counsel, her humility, her hospitality, her insight, her patience, her sacrifices, her faith, her hope, her love. Old Honest Dave was correct. He is not poor who has had a godly mother. Indebted, but not poor. Moms, on Mother's Day Sunday, we rise up and call you blessed. But knowing you, you'll feel uneasy in the limelight. You'll probably look for a place to hide. True servants are like that. You're probably going to be taken out to eat, which will add to our indebtedness. <laughs> but in all honesty, it won't come anywhere near expressing our gratitude. So live it up on Sunday. It's all yours. My advice? Shake up the family for a change. Order steak and lobster. <laughs> I remember years ago, when Christy and I were young, er, um, being the the Bible students that we were, um, we were of course arguing over <coughs> whose role was what and who was responsible for what. And uh, I made the foolish mistake of referring to Proverbs 31, and uh, she was rightly indignant. And uh, she said, "Well, if I'm supposed to do Proverbs 31, what are you supposed to do?" And being kind of snarky. I said, well, the rest of it. And I, I didn't realize at the moment how true that was uh, as God continues to open my eyes to see all that he's called me to, the, the very nature that he desires me to have. Um, but the flip side of this is, I can read through Proverbs 31, and I can put Christie's name in almost all of these verses. God has blessed me with a wonderful wife. In verse 10 it says, an excellent wife who can find. Well, I found one. And she's an even better mother. So, happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers here, whether biologically, by adoption, or just by inserting your lives into somebody's <coughs> life.
helping out where you could. So happy Mother's Day. Um, did any mothers here not get a flower? Monica, Anna, I know you're not <coughs> biologically, but you're, you're, you're there. Anyone else not get, Ben, did you go get two flowers and give one to Monica and one to Anna, please? They're by the front door. Who, who else? Yeah, she got one. She, she stuck it next to her head. It's not a tumor. <laughs> I tried to catch them as they came in, but some of them were pretty sneaky. Um, we are going to be starting a new series um, to kind of give you some background as to where we're going. Um, I know it'll come as, as quite the shock to you guys, but I tend to be pretty rigid in my thinking. I know, I mean, right? I mean, you guys thought I was all Mr. Bendable, Mr. Flexible. Um, I like things done a certain way. <laughs> Um, Christy and I have come to a very uh, good uh, mutual understanding. Um, there are places in the house that are hers, and I don't go there. I don't open those drawers. I don't go in that closet. If I need anything from there, I, I ask her. Um, because her method of organization is radically different from my method of organization. We also don't clean together. Um, if, if one of us is going to clean the house, it's one of us, not both of us. Um, her method of cleaning is radically different than mine. Um, I like things a certain way. Okay? Um, I can get completely thrown off if one thing is out of place. It, it, just, uh, it, it can mess up my order. Um, so. Years ago, um, I had someone that <coughs> shared with me something they felt that like God was telling them. Uh, and then a couple months ago, the same message came up through another person. And the essence of it was this. Uh, God wants me to do things out of order. To change the way that I do things. Um, I have a pattern for everything I do. Uh, getting dressed in the morning, there is a particular order that I get dressed. And, uh, you know, when I get up in the morning, my shirt goes on first, and then my socks, and then my pants, and then my shoes. And so I thought, okay, um, you know, for a couple days I got up and I put my socks on first, and that was just odd. <coughs> and then I felt God was prompting me, that's, that's not enough. And I actually told Christy, please pray for me, because I think God wants me to put my pants on first. <laughs> <laughs> you guys laugh, but you know, my pants, they typically go on last. And if I put them on and everything else is gone, I just look funny. And so I've had to put my pants on first. Uh, I've been taking different routes to places that I normally go. Uh, I have been changing up the order of my morning routine with my quiet time and time in the Word. And, and uh, I don't like it. I, re I really don't. Um, but there's a lesson in this that I think God is trying to show me. And so in this journey, I'm going to take you with me as we go, um, we all have boxes. We all have boundaries that we strive to keep God in. We all have certain expectations as to how that relationship is supposed to work. And, um, you know, we, we may even get as, as uh, detailed as what music is holy and what music is not. Uh, how old a song has to be before it becomes holy, um, whether or not uh, you pray in King James English, or, uh, you know, 
um, we all have our boxes. And I think what God is trying to teach me <coughs> is that God exceeds my expectations. God desires more from me than what I can give, what I, what I am comfortable giving. God doesn't fit in my boxes. He's bigger than them. Now, that's not to say that boxes are necessarily bad but they are a limitation, okay? Um, you take a box, uh, a while back, we had a big box. Um, my, my chair literally fell apart, and so Christy bought me a new chair, and there was a good-sized box, and uh, every one of the, the grandkids, with the exception of Phineas, uh, piled into the box. Like, when I was a kid, I loved playing boxes. We, we made all kinds of forts and things like that, and, uh, that was okay so long as it was cleaned up before Dad got home. Um, so I took the box and I just threw it out in the living room and, and left it there for the kids to come and play in. And it was kind of an interesting thing because even though physically all four of them could fit in the box, um, attitudinally, is that a word? I just made it up. All words are made up. Um, the four of them did not do well in the box together. They, they didn't. Um, certain of them insisted that they play one way while others wanted to play another. Uh, poor Co Cohen, he was coming and going and doing his own thing. Um, and, and that caused some distress for some of his older siblings because he wasn't following the rules. Um, There are a number of things that I'm going to address in the course of this series. Um, I've titled this, uh, What's My Job? What's Your Job? Okay. Now, I don't want you to get confused. Uh, this is not a matter of employment. Uh, this is a matter of uh, how you live your life and interact with God and with those around you, both in the church and outside of the church. Okay? And I honestly believe that God has great, great expectations for each and every person. I believe that God longs for greater intimacy, that he desires a, a boldness, that God desires interaction, uh, not just with, uh, you know, so many people come into church and they bring their, their Sunday best, and it has nothing to do with their clothes. It has to do with their attitudes. It has to do with how they present themselves in church. Uh, I remember years back, uh, there was a couple that was sitting uh, two or three rows in front of us at church, and um, I, I, I happened to notice that... Uh, they appear to be like your, your, your prototypical uh, Sunday church family. Um, singing all the songs with gusto, raising their hands, amening during through the service, the message. Um, they, were, they were a little bit loud, not, not real loud compared to some of the churches I've been to. Um, the loudest church I've ever been to was a church of about 45 people. It was a uh, uh, black church mm -hmm. in Maytown, Texas. Mm -hmm. And those people worship with abandon. Um, the limitations that we have in our lives are oftentimes those that we set ourselves or that we've allowed other people to set for us. Um, I've watched people that have become what they were told they were. Um, my nephew, uh, my, son, my brother adopted my nephew when he was 12 years old. Uh, he came from a, a pretty rough situation. 
Uh, his mother and father were divorced. Uh, they met at a party. They got into a fight. He got in the car to leave. She jumped on the hood to stop him. He peeled out. She fell off. She died. He went to jail. Uh, so he was passed around from family member to family member to foster home to foster home. And, and uh, he, he came into the Van Oak family with a lot of baggage. Um, when he was adopted, he was on eight or nine different medications to, to keep him calm, to, to um, basically keep him out of trouble. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just my kids. Uh, my my siblings and I and my kids, but little boys, that's that's how you know they're living. They're getting into trouble. Um, they're, they're experimenting. They're interacting with the world around them to see what works and what doesn't. Um, we we uh, don't usually have as many problems with the little girls until they get into the peer pressure thing. Um, Girls tend to be more verbal. We talked uh, a while back about Mackenzie and Christy and, and how uh, the boys, if Christy told them to do something, they might argue, but as soon as Christy realized it was arguing, it was talking back, it was done. Mackenzie just had this ability to discuss. <laughs> and, and she would pause it and, and Christy would respond and Mackenzie would rebut. And, it was exhausting. It was exhausting. Pick up the stupid towel and hang it on the rack. Or go put your clothes away. Whatever she's telling you, just do it. They're a different type of, of difficult. Not better, not worse, just different. Um, in this series, I'm not talking about how you present yourself in church. I'm talking about how you live your life. Uh, you know, integrity is what you do when people aren't looking. Okay. Um, you know, I've seen people uh, pick something up that was dropped and look around and walk the other direction. I've seen people pick up something that was dropped and chase them down and give it back. Um, integrity is something that has got to be intrinsic. It's got to be knitted into our character and who we are. Now notice I say integrity, not perfection. Okay? Because there's not a one of you. I, I certainly am never going to get to the point where I'm perfect or I'm without flaw this side of heaven. Okay? Um, we all stumble. James says we all stumble in many ways. Uh, but the idea is that increasingly, increasingly, we are doing better. Okay? So as part of this, uh, we're going to be looking at what my role looks like in the church, according to Scripture. Because I'll, I'll tell you right now, most of the churches in America have no clue what a pastor's role is supposed to be according to Scripture. Okay? And, and I know many men that are very successful pastors that according to the definition of pastor, they're not pastors. That's not a bad thing at all. They just have another gifting, another calling. Um, my roommate in college uh, pastors a, a church with several campuses. Um, he's, he's not a pastor. He's a preacher. He's a, he's a, a, a born leader. When it comes to people having issues, he's lost. He, he doesn't, he really gets, that's out of his comfort zone. You know, husbands and wives come in and there's difficulties in the marriage. He, he really struggles with that. Okay? Uh, that's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, I think that's a thing that needs to be addressed in his church. But, because we're in America, and, and Americans have this idea of what a pastor is supposed to be, um, there's expectations placed on every single pastor that they're not equipped to do. They're, they're not equipped to deal with. Because God has called us to specific places. He's given us specific gifts, specific callings, and specific callings. Now, part of this is, 
Well, we're going to look at what um, my role is as pastor of Jesus Community Church. But we are also going to look at what your role is. Okay? Because when we get into this, we're going to look in, we're going to be all over the place in, in this series. Uh, when we get into Ephesians chapter 4, there is a description of what part of my job is. <coughs> But then that leads to your job. Okay? So in this, we're going to look at a number of different things. Uh, we're going to go through the spiritual gifts. Don't walk out the door until you hear what I've got to say. Okay? Um, we are going to look at the, the interaction as what Scripture tells us how we should interact. And, and I'll tell you right now. Uh, we don't have a whole lot in common with the, the early church in the Bible. We, we're a, a radically different beast. Okay? Again, not necessarily bad, except that sometimes because of our little box, because of our preconceived idea of what church is supposed to look like and our role in it, a lot of times we miss things. Things don't get addressed because you don't realize that you're supposed to do it. Okay? Um, when we are called to this walk, salvation is the greatest gift you will ever receive. Okay? But walking the walk is one of the most difficult things you will ever do. Okay? Because you have to determine in your mind, being led by the Spirit, because... The Spirit is here, okay? You have to live out the change that has taken place in your heart. The old you, dead and gone. The new you, that, that's growing up. That's maturing in faith. That is walking out what this life is supposed to look like for a believer. You know? They, they call us Christians. That term originated as a word of scorn, mm -hmm. a mocking. Okay? Mm -hmm. they, they, the church, the, the people in Antioch looked at the people of the church and they're like, oh, it's those little, little Christs. And the church went, yes, perfect, that fits. Because we want to be like him. That should be our goal. We want to be like him. Now, I'm only wearing sandals in the three months of summer. He wore them year-round. I'm only doing it. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? Um, I'm not telling you that you need to, uh, you know, get blue contacts for your eyes and blonde hair because that's how all the pictures show up. <laughs> now, by the way, th those are just, that's a fallacy, folks. Oh, it's, it's horrible. Um, Jesus was Semitic. He probably had olive skin, very dark hair, and very dark eyes. And you don't very often see any pictures showing him that way. Okay? Uh, the a couple things that we know about him, uh, there was nothing about him that would attract us to him. Okay? So, um, I think, uh, I think he must, this is just my thought, I have no scripture to back this up, I think he must have had the most incredible eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that you could see something there that you couldn't see anywhere else. I don't, you know, I, I'm sure they were probably brown, but I think there was something there. Um, the nearest I can come to what that would be is when a mother has just birthed their child. And they take the baby and they lay the baby up on the mother. And through the trials and the travails of childbirth, when that child is laid down, something comes over moms. And I think it's kind of a glimmer of the way God looks at his children because there's just something there that's beautiful. Okay? The way their eyes are gazing on their child, um, it's amazing. And if you haven't seen that, um, I, I can't explain it to you. Okay. There's a radiance that comes from the inside, and it's like all the love that she could ever have in all of her life in that moment is poured out to that little life. 
And I think that's the way that Jesus must have looked at us. I think that, that there was just something deep there. So we're going to look at our interactions. We're going to look at the gifts. We're going to look at what Scripture requires of us both corporately <coughs> and individually. Because there are certain things that you are going to be called to that I am not. That I'm not equipped to do. Um, you know, I know, I know when I need a mechanic. When my car didn't work. I don't know. I put the key in, I turned it, it didn't work. Okay? I know enough to know us. Well, when I turned it, the lights didn't come on. So I know it's an electric something or another. Um, I tried to jump it, twisted my ankle. Um, you know, yeah. When I was a kid, my mom's car died and, and somebody was coming to jump it and I sat with my head pasted to the window because we were jumping over his car. <laughs> Our car never moved. I was so disappointed, so heartbroken as a child. We gotta be careful with our words. Um, so, there's a couple things that I, I want to share with you real quick. Um, I believe with all my heart that we are on the cusp of something. I believe that specifically for this church, but I believe that specifically for the church in America because lines have got to be drawn. The holiness of the church cannot take second place to the cultural identity, to political correctness, to, and, and the, the, the nature and the identity of the church is that we speak the truth in love. Okay. We've got a lot of people that, that can speak truth, but they come across as judgmental and, and uncaring. Um, Jesus spoke the truth. I, you think about the story of the rich young ruler. Um, Jesus told him, hey, this is what's necessary. I've done all that. Okay. And then it says, and Jesus looked at him. And he said, one thing you lack. Go sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Okay. Now, I don't believe Jesus is telling all of us to do that. But I think you need to be in a place that you would be willing to. Should he call? Okay. Um, we have many, many idols. Everybody thinks the idols went out in the Old Testament. Oh, no. We have a lot of idols. Money is prime among them in America. Materialism. Everybody needs newer and bigger and better. Okay. Um, so... A couple of things I just wanted to address real quickly. Um, I don't know what we're on the cusp of. Uh, a lot of times when I'm praying, it's one of those things that you kind of can catch out of the corner of your eye, but when you turn to look at it, it's not there. Okay? Um, A number of things coming out of this. In the church, there are a couple things that are required of us. Uh, when you come to salvation, when you come to that place where you surrender to God, you turn your life over to Him, we understand that it's His grace plus the faith that He gives us that leads to salvation, but it doesn't stop there. That's the start, not the end. Because if you look, um, it says works will come out of that. Okay? Works that God has prepared for us to do. Um, I don't know what kind of works he might have for you. Some of you, I have an idea. Uh, some of you, I've been watching you like a hawk for several years because I know God's going to be doing stuff with you. And, and you better be prepared, because I'm not going to stop praying for it. Okay? And that's one of those things that I know I'm praying according to his will. Um, now, I don't necessarily know uh, the details of it, but I know that, that God has specific plans for a number of you in the church that he's just shared with me. 
I believe God has a specific plan for every single one of you, a place that he wants to put you. Um, so works. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, salvation comes by grace through faith, uh, and but it's unto works. Um, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, fruit. Jesus says in John chapter 8, uh, verses 7 through 10, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, <coughs> one of the things that bothers me about the church in America, we've missed the first part of that in our excitement to get to the second part. Okay? Okay. We forget about abiding in him and his words abiding in us and we, we kind of bleep over those and we get to the ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. Um, you know, James addresses that question. Uh, he says you have not because you ask not or because you ask amiss. You ask wrongly that you might spend it on your pleasures. Okay. If that doesn't cry America, I don't know what does. Okay. Um, one of the most amazing things that happens in America, everybody wants just a little bit more. You know, if I just got a raise, I just had a little bit extra money, I'd be okay. But then as soon as you get a little bit more money, what do you do? You get a little bit more bills. Um, if we abide in him, and his word is in us, which, by the way, that's why we're doing scripture memorization. Okay? Um, we want his word ready for us to use in the moment. Okay? Um, so, as for what you wish, it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you, he that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. See, you cannot separate the two. If you profess to love God and disobey him, there's something wrong with your scenario. There's something wrong in your equation. Okay, But if you... you are dogmatic about the word and you forget the love, you become religious. Okay? You're, you're more concerned about the law than you are about the relationship. So these things are together. They're knitted and tied together. You cannot separate them. Okay? So um, the commandments and abiding. And we're, we're going to be talking about what it means to abide as we go through here. Uh, so we have works. We have fruit. And, and actually, one of the fruits that I'm going to deal with separately is that uh, we have love. Okay? Um, and this, this love that we have um, is something that is very often opposed to our nature. Okay? Um, there, there is, there's uh, very much in the way that we are designed, uh, the way that sin has corrupted us, that makes this kind of love very, very difficult. It's a discipline. It takes work, okay? Because the measure of love is, is not based on somebody doing something for you. Uh, it's based on what he has done for me and my choice to love despite what they've done, okay? Uh, if you're not receiving it here, you can't put it out there, okay? So love. Uh, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you. Okay? A new commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Now think about that for a moment. Okay, Jesus is coming up to the end of his time on earth. The disciples have been with him for three plus years. They've seen him in action. Uh, they are going to see the depth, the height, and the breadth of his love within a couple days. Um, 
This is the love that he is calling us to have one for another. Okay? But it doesn't stop there. Because scripture also says uh, in Acts chapter 2, I'm just going to read a little snippet here. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is a perfect place for us to start with what the church should look like. Uh, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, one other attribute besides love, uh, and when we get, each of these is going to be a different message. Okay? I'm not just going to give you a snippet on love and then leave it. Uh, we're really going to start digging into what this thing looks like. Uh, but another thing that, that has got to earmark every Christian, it has got to be a part of your life. Being thankful. <clears throat> Having an attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, I, I read an article um, uh, three, four days ago, or last month, I don't know, uh, they were doing tests on people, and they were doing brain scans, um, uh, and some of them, they actually found they had them. Uh, <laughs> but what they were doing is they were scanning people, uh, and they were measuring, they would engage in conversation with them, and they would test what was going on in their brain at the different things that were going on. And, and when they complained or when they griped, it actually rewired their brain. And the more they did it, the more rewired that it got. Okay? Until it became the natural process. Okay? <coughs> we are called to not fall to that. We are not called to grumble. We're not called to complain. We're not called to whine. Okay? And that's, that's tough for us. You know? Um, that's hard. A lot of people take medication for things like that. Okay? So we have got to become a people of thanksgiving. We have got to have hearts that acknowledge the incredible blessings that God has given us. Because he has blessed us abundantly. Amen. Now, keep in mind, there will be a day where we will account for every bit of that. What would you do with it? Okay? Um, so, uh, Thanksgiving. I'm going to stop right there. Okay? Um, two other areas that we're going to get into... Uh, the body of Christ, uh, the need that we have for each other. And uh, preferring one another. Preferring the brothers and sisters above yourself. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to get into each of these. Um, you know, typical for, for my series, uh, I've got about 12 messages outlined, so it should probably take us a good year and a half. Um, so, you know, um, <coughs> Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for your spirit that comes and teaches, guides us. I thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of your son. That, Father, your mercy and your grace were so great that you paid the price. I thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us that you have given us the right to be your children. I thank you, Father, for the many, many blessings you pour into our lives. Help us, Father, to be a people of thanksgiving, that we would rejoice much. That, Father, we would not give in to this world, that we would not be complainers or whiners, but, Father, we would have hearts full of thanksgiving. 
Open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear. Father, may the soil of our soul provide good food and much abundance. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.